Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Good morning. Welcome to the class on rain gardens. Um, I want to begin uh, by introducing myself. I coordinate the Master Gardener Program um, and I'm a natural resource specialist. And this presentation will whet your appetite for rain gardens and tell you a little bit more information about them and how to install them. But I would recommend that if you are uh, seriously interested in adding a rain garden to your property, that you consult the resources <clears throat> at the end of the program. They have excellent step-by-step -step, um, in, uh, instructions and um, a lot of um, good uh, process thinking uh, for you to um, consider before you begin the, a project on a rain garden. So these are the topics that we're going to be covering. I mean, we're going to define a rain garden and why you might want one. <clears throat> Choosing the best stormwater method, and that might not be a rain garden, that might be another alternative. A few questions that you need to ask yourself about site analysis and very important information about how rain garden soils are different um, than your other soils in your landscape. The parts of a rain garden, a few tips on installation, and choosing the right plants for the right places in the rain garden. Maintaining a little bit about design and again, and some important resources at the end. So let's start by defining rain gardens. Um, a synonymous term that you'll hear is bioretention and that in, in this presentation, we'll use those as synonyms. Sometimes bioretention is used by professionals in the field for a more engineered solution for stormwater um, that has, might have an under, under drain or a little more complicated uh, flow pattern and a different kind of retention. So, but for this presentation, we use bio and bioretention and rain garden synonymously. <clears throat> so rain garden is a sh landscape depression uh, that re receives runoff from surrounding rooftops, driveways, your yard, and it simulates the runoff treatment provided by a natural area like a forest. The primary component is the filter bed and it has special soil uh, that percolates well and a mixture, and that's usually a mixture of sand, soil, organic matter topped with a mulch layer and then plants. Here's some key concepts to know right away about rain gardens. Rain gardens don't stay wet. The water should filter through the bed with not longer than 48 hours later. And the runoff can temporarily pond four to 12 inches above that mulch layer. But again, it should be draining within 48 hours. Rain gardens should preserve and enhance the natural features of a landscape. And locally native plants rather than cultivars should be used for the plant material. And a native is defined here as a plant species that occurs in a particular region, state, ecosystem, and habitat without any direct or indirect human actions. And that's the federal definition. So that's what we're going to use. And you should choose specific plants for different areas of the basin because some of the areas are drier and some of the areas stay wetter. Uh, plants in a rain garden must be able to withstand uh, dry and wet conditions. And they might need, need to be thinned after a couple years, usually three years, and they might, you might need to do some replanting. You want to monitor your conditions regularly and you do all your weeding by hand so that you're not bringing heavy equipment into the bioretention area. If the soil does not percolate or infiltrate within that 48 hours, an underdrain might be needed. And, and that would be a whole... Um, a different level of rain garden that you might want to get some professional assistance with. You don't want to locate your rain garden in a soggy area with poorly drained soil. That's the most frequent question we get. If we have a wet area and if a client has a wet area in their yard that stays wet for many days after the rain, a lot of people uh, want recommendations for a rain garden there. And, and that's not an appropriate place because it won't drain. Don't locate your rain garden within 10 feet of a foundation. And don't locate your rain garden under tree canopy above utilities or septic fields or next to wells. At least 50 feet away from the well is recommended. So why would you want to add a rain garden? One of the best uh, management practices is to reduce stormwater's negative effect. 
You're mimicking that natural absor absorption and pollutant removal that a forest or a meadow would give you. Rain gardens can absor absorb runoff very efficiently if they're built correctly. They can absorb 30 to 40% more than a standard lawn because of the, uh, the special soil and the, the plants with the root systems. So let's look for a minute here. And this is um, showing you a more natural system and about 10% of that stormwater would run off from these because the trees would slow it down and soak it in. There's more, there's deeper infiltration um, than you, you'd have with like a concrete cover. Uh, and then in uh, contrast, you get about 55% runoff when you have all this um, concrete hard surfaces, and we call that impervious surface. And so you only get about 5% deep infiltration into the water table and about 10% shallow infiltration, and that's if you're lucky. So a forest is the best stormwater solution for absorbing that stormwater and slowing it down and soaking it in. But we can't put a forest everywhere. As our watersheds change, the areas in our neighborhood change, and there's more um, hard services put in, imper impervious area, um, that can really affect the drainage, as you probably know, in your own yard. So when rainwater hits an impervious surface, it picks up pollutants along the way, and, and that flows into the storm drains directly. And that goes directly into rivers, lakes, wetlands, um, oceans eventually creating problems for biodiversity as well as public health issues. Uh, there's flooding of surface water and erosion of stream banks with uh, a stronger flow of stormwater across an impervious surface. The water table doesn't get recharged underneath the impermeable surfaces. It goes right into a storm drain rather than allowing it to percolate down into the um, water table and aquifers. There's formation of um, stagnant water puddles, and if, if water sits around for uh, more than 24 hours, and that becomes a breeding place for mosquitoes. And let me just put in a caveat right now, not to spray for mosquitoes on your property. The best way that you can handle uh, mosquitoes if you have a, a problem is to make sure that there's not even a teaspoon of water being held in your yard uh, in any kind of container, including a uh, uh, like French drains or, or anything that would even collect a, a teaspoon of soil, um, I mean, a teaspoon of water. Um, there's a heat island effect when, when rainwater hits an impervious surface, it can heat the water and that will increase air temperatures and it'll affect that, that it'll heat that water up that goes back into the waterways and that affects plant and animal life. So, I don't know if you've seen this before, but here's a sewer pipe and that takes the sewer waste from our toilet and our sinks and our um, kitchens. And then there's a, the, the stormwater pipe and, and the stormwater uh, does not get treated. It goes directly to uh, rivers, bays, streams, sewer waste water gets treated and that's the difference. Um, and so we have to do everything we can in our landscape to make sure that we're soaking it in and slowing it down and absorbing any of the pollutants before they get to our stream. Some advantages of bioretention, um, rain gardens can filter out and capture metals and petroleum pollutants, particles and nutrients. And when I talk about nutrients, that might be fertilizer or pet waste or wildlife uh, waste. And bioretention absorbs that excess water and slows it down. It will trap nitrogen uh, and that might be from excess fertilizer, fertilizer that's left on impervious surface like on the sidewalk, uh, phosphorus, which carries along with it uh, sediments and, and um, herbicides and pesticides, um, and silt, um, heavy siltation will come with um, stormwater sometimes too, and a bioretention can capture that. Now that can accumulate in the rain garden and may need to be maintained. It, at least we know it's not going into our stormwater, into our streams. So here's a diagram from uh, Washington State University. And you can see the rain garden is shaped kind of like a bathtub. And a really, um, this does not have an underdrain in it. It has a flat bottom. It's got amended soil that infiltrates quickly. It's got a mulch layer and it, 
at native trees, uh, I would recommend not using cultivars. A soil mix and you have an overflow and a backflow. And it, the water flows off of the roof down the, down the um, drain pipe and across that landscaped areas in the swale or pipe. Bioretention or other best management practices. You might want to consider rain garden, but there are some other alternatives. And here's a few other options. This, this slope has uh, native plant material put on it and a dry riverbed uh, and, and improved soil to soak it in. That's more of a conservation landscaping. And the dry riverbed just slows down the flow and, and you notice it's on a curve, so that makes it uh, a little bit slower too. This is a grassy swale. Um, it's got some uh, native grasses on either side. Here's um, a check, some check dams with vegetation. Um, and this is probably your most, one of your more um, expensive options, uh, pervious pavers. And so you can add several of these together and come up with what's called a treatment train. Uh, oops. So, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So bioretention or a rain garden might be your best solution, but it might not. And um, the um, Extension Service in Tennessee has a really good rain garden page and it has a flow chart and that will help you cons uh, consider some options and whether uh, bioretention rain gardens are a good option. So you can go to that site and take that little flow chart and run it through for your property. So a treatment train is um, just several different practices that are put together. It might be a meadow, uh, to a rain garden, to a swale, uh, to pervious pavers, or, or any combination of those. Some communities have developed. Um, this is a, a community that has encouraged green infrastructure, just green planting uh, to absorb stormwater. And this, this house has a meadow in front. This article shows you what this community did and came up with some treatment trains that are, you know, successive best practices uh, for stormwater to hit one, get filtered, hit, hit another, slow it down. Um, and so uh, you can read more about that idea. But in a treatment train, um, you might have a green roof first, which is another expensive option, uh, permeable pavers uh, and going into a rain garden and maybe uh, excess going into a cistern for reuse or a rain barrel. So that just gives you an idea. And um, these two are the least expensive of the options. They use all these physical processes, um, infiltration, transpiration, uh, uh, sedimentation. So, so the sediment goes in and is collected, it filters it. The plants um, nitrify or they take nitrogen out of the the stormwater and pathogens can be absorbed there too. And chemically, you can have adsorption or absorption. Um, and so um, a treatment train can multiply the advantages of green practices. So if you want to take a, a minute to look at your property, you might want to um, go to County Mapper and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. You want to do a sketch of your site. Um, just a simple sketch. You don't have to be an artist, including setbacks, existing utilities, common areas where your property ends and begins. And before you do anything, um, any digging, of course, you want to call Miss Utility and have everything marked carefully. Rain garden needs to be located in a lower spot where stormwater from the surrounding landscape can drain into it. You want a basin. For the basin, you want a flat area, uh, very flat. And you, you can uh, do that when you construct it to make sure that happens. You can do a rain garden on a slope. Um, that picture I showed you with the stop dams with the rocks is one option. It can be split into individual rain gardens going down the slope uh, to make the slope more gradual. And when, when the uphill cell or rain garden gets filled, it can spill into the next one or, or even a grassy swale below it. So if you go to County Mapper or on our county website, this is my neighborhood and these yellow lines show the contours and the closer the yellow lines are together, the steeper the slope. And you can see that here's my house here and uh, I back up to a stream and I, I do have some slope, but it's not, this is actually more sloped right here. 
So my impervious surfaces are all of this road, some from this road. I have a driveway here that's impervious that water doesn't soak in. Then I have a rain garden over this area farther than 10 feet from my house. I have the um, gut, gutter and the downspout are directed directly into that. You can take a walk around your property during a rainstorm, and but get all the information first before you undertake the, a project. Find how much drainage area you have. Actually measure everything that runs into it. And bioretention or rain gardens are often that the biggest problem. They're undersized because people underestimate the amount of impervious surface. As you can see from this, I need to add the square footage for everything that's coming downhill on this road here, maybe even this driveway will be flowing into right into my yard because I'm downstream, I'm downhill from them. So you're going to take into consideration anything asphalt, concrete, decks, roofs, um, sidewalks, uh, driveways, and per permeable surfaces um, just as a comparison are like planting beds, mulch beds, gravel, pavers that have, have ability to soak in stormwater and turf unless the soil is compacted. Now, compacted soil under turf is just uh, as impermeable as um, cement can be. Uh, don't underestimate the amount of rainfall. We used to estimate everything based on a one-inch rainfall event, but that has gotten tremendously uh, larger over the years. So. Make sure you do your homework first and measure all your impervious surfaces. So during a one inch rainstorm on one acre, 27,000 gallons are deposited. So again, can't underestimate the amount of rain. Now you may not have an acre and it all not, may not all be flowing into one area, but for every inch of rainfall, 0.623 gallons fall. So you can use that as a multiplier to figure out the surface of square feet of your roof or other impervious surfaces. And if you're on a slope, um, if you remember from, probably from um, high school, uh, measuring slope, um, you measure the height and you put some stakes in and a level string and that way you can get a percentage slope. Uh, this one's about 6%. So to size your rain garden, I use an online calculator. The Rain Garden Alliance has some good material on it. Uh, you're going to see how many downspouts are going to actually be flowing into your rain garden. Uh, what is the size of your roof, the drainage area, everything that's impervious. And, and this calculator will help you know what the depth of your rain garden needs to be, the slope of the drainage area, uh, what type of soil. And plan for a one-inch rainstorm, but as I mentioned, storms are getting heavier, so you might want to leave some room to spare. Again, just to repeat, don't locate your rain garden within 10 feet of a building foundation or over utilities, not near a steep slope or bluff or near an existing septic or drain field or tank. Don't put it in a low spot that doesn't drain well. I would avoid tree areas. Uh, you, uh, because you're going to be disturbing tree roots and the vegetation is going to compete uh, with the tree roots and it's probably going to win and your tree will suffer. Don't put it where there's a high ground water during the winter or near a well, 50 feet from confined wells and 100 feet from unconfined wells. So when to call a professional? Um, I'm going to show you about the infiltration test and if you need an under drain because you can't um, modify the soil enough to get drainage within 48 hours, you will need a, a, an under drain and that might be a perforated PVC pipe that will ha give you a sand and gravel that will be placed in a sand and gravel bed to hold, have some holding ability. Uh, but I, I would call a professional probably if, I, if it required an under drain, although I have worked with a homeowner who put an under drain in very successfully, but he I think he had like an engineering background, but um, probably a lot of you have that expertise. I, I just um, would caution you uh, to consider a professional for an undertrain. Let's talk about the important topic of soils. Most bioretention soils are about six to 12 inches mixture of sand, compost, and native soil. And again, it, that will drain in 48 hours. That's the key. <laughs> native soil is great. Um, and, but you need to mix it with a mixture of compost and sand to make it more porous. 
So you may be taking all the native soil out and mixing it together. Uh, native plants are well suited to those native soils, so they do need the nutrients with the sand and the compost. Usually it's about 50 to 60 percent sand, 20 to 30 percent topsoil um, with low clay content, and about 20 to 30 percent compost. If you have some excess soil from, from excavating left over, you need to figure out where you're going to put that and how you're going to stabilize it because that can create certainly um, runoff and siltation <laughs> into the area you just cleaned out. So you're going to go about 6 to 12 inches below, I would say 12 to 18 probably for sites with heavy clay content. There's the infiltration test. You're aiming for about 2 inch per hour of drainage. So you're going to dig in an area that you're considering and check it about a, a two foot by one foot pit. Check for water seeping as you're digging. Uh, see if water co just comes in and that would be a bad sign. Uh, you fill it with a hose for with about eight to 12 inches of water and then repeat and you can put it, you see they have a nail right there uh, <clears throat> marking this, oops, excuse me, marking the spot and that way you can judge whether it's draining. Uh, put, put the marker on the highest point and then measure and time how long, how many inches uh, per hour it drops. So two inches per hour is ideal. And if it's a low infiltration rate, uh, but it's still draining within 48 hours, um, but slowly you might want to consider putting in a drain. So let's talk about the anatomy of a rain garden. A grass buffer strip around the garden slows the velocity of the runoff. The mulch layer provides organic matter, reduces weeding, maintains soil moisture, and a soil layer is where the plants will collect that moisture and nutrients to grow. The ponding area is the depression in the rain garden, and it's going to provide storage while um, you're waiting for that 48 hours for infiltration. And then usually you have you, and you always have a berm area that's at least six inches of soil or rocks that works like a dam to improve to pond runoff. So here's some rain garden zones. You see this, this uh, rain garden here just experienced a rain storm and it's got, the, it's got a berm over here. It's got some inflow here from the impervious, from the, from the grassy area. And there are different zones for, um, for plants. On the edge, you might have some uh, plants that like mesic or drier conditions, um, some, some ones on the slope that can handle emergent, uh, emerging water and semi-aquatic maybe in the center. Although any plant you choose should be able to handle drought and deluge in a rain garden. They have to be uh, a flexible native plant to do that. Here's my property again, and I'm getting a new roof, thank goodness. Um, but you can see that this, all the siltation here, that's probably part, part of my mulch pile too, but about 10 feet, oh, about 12 feet off of the Here's the downspout. I have the downspout underground directed into the rain garden area. I don't have a drain. It infiltrates well. I have Monarda and a lot of native plants uh, planted in the middle. Cardinal plant, cardinal flower, uh, Physostegia, the dragon head. And on the out, outskirts, I have some ground cover. So uh, I'm get, but I am getting rain garden down the driveway from the street and off the roof, at least this section of the roof is draining directly into that. There's another picture, you can see the rest of my yard, I have kind of a treatment train because the rest of my yard is a meadow. I have limited um, impervious, I have impervious surface here, but this is rocks and uh, very pervious. Uh, this is pervious uh, with just pavers in between. And it, it's more of a, um, you know, a naturalized landscape, um, more of a messy landscape than some people like. So installing a rain garden, you're going to be working with dry soil. Don't pick a rainy day because when you when you dig soil, you want it to be dry so that you're kind of you're not messing up the structure of it. It helped. This is a hard job. This this takes a lot of energy and time. Have all your materials ready ahead of time, and we'll talk about what those are. Again, Commerce Utility. Mark off your area with landscape paint or flags, and you can kill the grass um, if, if it's a grassy area beforehand, and I'll show you some pictures of occultation and solarization, and you need to plan ahead to do that. 
uh, at this point, I would, if you're going to install a rain garden, I would plan on killing the grass off this summer and then uh, installing it in the fall. And then again, your amended soil is different from just, it's not potting soil, it's not native soil, it's a mixture of sand, compost, and native soil. And the under drain, if you're going to have to put in one of those, that's going to re require a couple different kinds of gravel and a perforated pipe. River rock, you might want to consider using that for the inflow if your design needs a stone inlet. So here's some ways to kill the grass uh, beforehand, and you could do this in the summer. Uh, this is occultation. That's just the term that people use cut off from view. And you put a black weed barrier over a plant filled with winter annuals or summer annuals and uh, covering the soil to create a dark, warm, moist environment. Solarizing is, is similar, although it uses clear plastic, and the key is watering the soil deeply beforehand and securing the edges so you're cooking turf and any weeds under there, uh, trapping the heat in there, and uh, leave it in, on about four weeks in the hottest part of the summer. You can keep checking it, and then you can reuse the plastic. There are areas in my yard I, 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 I do this in different areas of my yard uh, almost every year. So here's a rain garden project that we did at uh, Westminster at Lake Ridge. And uh, this is the first day that we went out and you can see this is a carport area, but we have a slope here of concrete drive and curbs. And this is all impervious here and it's draining right into this area. area. It's not actually draining into this area. It's going down here and it's going right into a stream. So we decided this would be a good Master Gardener project and Josh Josh is a landscape uh, architect that helped help with the plans for this. Uh, we built a berm here and used a tamper, a soil tamper to construct that berm and make it really firm. We amended the soil and Master Gardeners would take handful, we, we calibrated our hands so we put would put several handfuls of compost, several handfuls of, of sand and several handfuls of the native soil. Um, you know, we figured out the combination of those uh, to create the right soil mix. You can buy engineered soils. They're kind of expensive, but um, that might be worth it to you. You can see this, the rain barrel was put up to capture the first flush uh, from the roof, and that, then that pipe will go right into the rain garden. And these were provided by friends of the Occoquan and decorated by residents of Westminster at Lake Ridge. So these were the steps we used. We excavated to proper depth. Uh, we removed the vegetation. Uh, when we excavated, we did have some power equipment there, but they stayed out of the basin because we don't want to compact the soil in that area. So that was done very carefully. We built the inflow, and this is one of the inflows that we, we did with a rocky channel. We built the berm next and filled it with the soil medium, planted, and mulched. And then we double checked. We went back and had residents check out the, uh, to see how it, it was functioning. Soil uh, removed in the, um, creating the depth can be used, reused to build that berm. And you, you know, you would use a soil tamper to make sure that berm is very stable. And usually the, again, the, the basin area is usually 12 to, to 36 inches deep and there's six in inches left of ponding area that's standing above the soil to give you a little bit of leeway. Amendments in soil can be anywhere from two to 30 inches. Um, and storm, this Alliance for the Bay website has some really good um, diagrams. So plant selection. This is echinacea or um, purple coneflower, and it's actually not native to Northern Virginia but um, it's an okay selection, but most of the plant recommendations I'm gonna make are native plants to Northern Virginia, and I'll show you some resources for selecting those. Successful rain garden plants, again, can handle deluge and drought. They, they are not your typical uh, garden center plants. They're, they're sturdy and they're native and um, they're suited to the soils and the climate that we have. Again, some, some uh, areas of the rain garden are wetter and some of them are drier. So you wanna pick the plants accordingly. Avoid any invasives. This is Nandina in which the berries are toxic to birds. We wanna, and, and it, they spread rapidly into natural areas. Barbary harbors ticks and um, seeds heavily into natural areas, burning bush. 
So you want to avoid invasive plants and Department uh, of Wildlife Resources has a good list of those. Choose native plants. Can't go wrong as long as you have the right um, conditions. You want to choose native plants. This is a great website, uh, Plant Nova Natives. Uh, and these are well suited. They don't require fertilization. They're drought tolerant once you establish them. They may need some irrigation the first year or two, but after that, when they're, they're well established, they won't need that. They're critically important for pollinators, beneficial insects, and our songbirds. So these are the choices that I would recommend you make. Look at the root system on these plants versus turf grass. Here's turf grass on the left. But these native plants, and not all of these are native to Northern Virginia, but native plants tend to have great root systems that will do a really good job of absorbing that water. Here's some design ideas for rain gardens. Uh, they can look just like a regular garden, except for they're performing an important function that's a little bit more advanced than a, a, your normal uh, landscape. Uh, for wet sites in the sun, I'd recommend these. Uh, and these could go in the bottom of the basin. They like a lot of water. And so they would stay wet the longest. Bee balm, cardinal flower, and lobelia. I have all of these in that deepest area of my rain garden. Uh, here's some other plants. These are for part sun. So if you've got a, you know, a, a area that gets some shade, um, turtle head um, are, is a favorite with bumblebees. Some, any sedges. There are lots of different sedges. These are two that are shown here, sensitive fern can take part shade and golden ragwort. And so these are all beautiful native plants that can do, a, do the job for you. Uh, some shrubs can go in uh, and you might wanna put these on the slope or at the top in the drier areas, but clethora uh, or summer sweet, itea or sweet spire, uh, calicarpa or beautyberry or alex glabra, they, they could all handle the well-draining soil of a rain garden. Here's some other rain garden plants for the drier areas from Culver's root or Veronicastrum, obedient plant, Physostegia. Amazonia has, is more like a, a shrub, blue star and Baptisia australis. That, that's a slow grower, but it's a gorgeous plant. Rain gardens for the uh, plants for the transition zone, uh, areas between the basin and the top part, these can handle both drought and deluge. <laughs> But um, and they're great for pollinators. They're beautiful color. They can help with the absorption. Joe pie, bottle gentian, and common sneezeweed. These like a little bit wetter areas. Here's some other shrubs for the transition zone: cranberry viburnum and witch hazel, New Jersey tea. They like a little bit drier conditions in the on that slope area. Again. I, I think golden ragwort's in here twice. I must really like it. Uh, wood fern, these are, you can have a rain garden that's in the shade and here's some options for, of plants for that. So do you wanna buy pots, plugs, or seeds? And pots are the most expensive, plugs are the next expensive, and seeds are the least expensive, but you have more, uh, you have to have more care, especially at first with plugs and seeds. So plugs are best for garden gardeners who don't mind a little bit of waiting. And they're just really little landscape plugs. Uh, each one of these little plants that the girls on the left are planting are, are a plug. They do dry out quickly, so they will need uh, some attention until they get well established the first or second year. And they're usually typically planted point, you know, half a half a um, foot apart. And it's really good for kids to plant there. All you have to do is make a little divot and put it in and then water it good for a good while. Containers are best if you want immediate gratification. Again, they're more expensive. And spacing depends. Make sure you look at the mature size of the plant. So a well-designed rain garden doesn't look any different from another garden. And you might want to choose a rule of three. Pick three plants with three features you love. And, um, and do it in, you can do it in multiples of three, three, six, or nine plants, plant a drift, three to seven for a bigger impact. Um, and that's better for attracting pollinators too, instead of putting a single plant and spacing them widely. It's plant densely or use ground covers to reduce the weeding. Remember, to plan for the mature size of the plants so you don't overcrowd things. So. And create some interest in all seasons. It would be good to have something that blooms in the early spring and some in the summer and some in the um, late summer to fall. 
So for maintenance, you want to check for sediment buildup. You want to mon be monitoring the health of the plants and pruning and weeding, just like you would any other garden. It might need to be irrigated. You know, every summer we have drought conditions, it seems. Monitor the movement of the mulch and maybe a plant replaced in another area can help the mulch stay more stable. The, the bottom, again, remember it should be flat and not uneven to avoid pooling. Uh, check for any blockages at the inflow or the outflow and scouring. That's evidence of material being moved off site. Soil that is heavily contaminated may need to be replaced in a few years. So this is a progression of a, main, of a rain garden when it was first built from 2011 to 2016. So normal plant care, but also looking out for um, the inlet and the outflow, making sure they're still functioning as appropriate. Glutens can go into rain gardens, nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus from, um, from fertilizer applications, if they're not done carefully, can run into it. Uh, heavy metals, salts, de-icers, car fluids, pesticides, and herbicides. And usually the highest concentration of these pollutants is in that first inch of rainfall. The rain garden catches and keeps uh, all these things out of streams. Bacteria in the soil is usually handled by the plants pretty well. And they can biodegrade up a pollutant rather than, and transform it rather than just storing it or sending it onto our streams. So for design, any shape that captures, captures a runoff and complements the landscape is, is a good idea. Check the flow of water on a rainy day. And usually that the width of the rain garden is perpendicular to the flow, so it captures a good amount of rain. Here are the resources that I mentioned. You might want to take a... a snapshot of this with your cell phone. Um, again, this is just an introduction to get you thinking in terms of what needs to be done before you build a rain garden, but these will help you step by step. But we have an extension horticulture help desk that you can email us uh, at any time, and we will master gardeners staff that on weekdays. And if they can't answer the question, then staff is there to back them up. So please uh, let us know if you have questions about this. And I Thank you very much for coming and we'll handle some questions. Nancy, you had one question in the chat room about uh, do the um, rain gardens work as well in the winter at slowing down water when the plants are um, dormant? Yeah, yeah. It's, a lot of our plants, you know, can absorb um, rainwater um, even when they're dormant. Um, and that's why we, sometimes we tell you to irrigate unless the ground is frozen. So gr frozen ground is gonna be pretty imp impenetrable, but um, as soon as that thaw occurs, then, then you can get um, good infiltration. Who wants to do a rain garden? <laughs> Did I make it sound too difficult? Nancy, this is Maritza. I thought I needed a rain garden until I just refreshed on your briefing because the area that I was considering probably needs something else because it does um, pool there and it does not move at all. Meaning when my backyard was built, the county actually put a swale through this area that I'm having a problem with. Mm -hmm. um, and then neighbors construction on both sides of me have mm -hmm. caused that to be a pool area, but mm -hmm. yeah, it stays wet. It's not something I think I would be able to clear within 48 hours, no matter how <laughs> deep yeah. I dug it. So yeah. might well, need you, another solution. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, feel free to send us some pictures and it, if the master gardener on duty has questions, I can talk it through with them and you, um, you know, sometimes you can put a plant that likes wet feet there and, uh, you know, a shrub that particular, yeah. uh, you know, and so there, there may be solutions to that. Um, in addition, I've been thinking of the sweet spire because I love them and I have a few in my yard that are right now covered with too much shade. So they might be yeah. happier if I move them closer to that area. But 
It then good. it starts to break up the current design. <laughs> oh, I know, I but, know. Yeah, so, but no, I have to play with it because I really am losing that grass there every year, every year, every year with the water yeah. sitting on And it. you know, native grasses would, are an excellent choice too. You, you know, make sure that if you're going to use one that you want it to stay there for a while because they're pretty hard <laughs> to dig up with those roots. But like a switchgrass at, or a little blue stem, um, they have excellent root systems and they, you know, they can handle drought and they can handle water. So you might want to consider those. Um, there are some beautiful native grasses out there for any, I mean, the, they are cultivars, but any color combination. Um, Shenandoah uh, is a burgundy switchgrass and um, uh, there's one that's blue. Uh, I can't think of it for a little blue stem, blue and purple. Oh, it's called... Um, Encore or something like that. Well, so. I will certainly look into those because those would fit in quite well. Okay, there you go. And yeah. <laughs> one one will do probably. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Nancy, you have a question. What large uh, bush or tree suggestions do you have for the wet, moderate regions? Okay, um, let's go back and look at those slides for a minute. I'm sorry about these slides. I don't even know what happened there. Gremlins. <laughs> um, the New Jersey tea, uh, probably not. It likes, it likes kind of sandy soil and well-draining soil. Uh, witch hazel would, would do beautifully, I think, in a, in a moderate, you know, in the transition zone. Cranberry viburnum. These are all native. Oops. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> um, so any of those would be um, appropriate. Let's look at these other ones. Let's see. And these are fairly easy shrubs to find uh, commercially. American Beautyberry or Calicarpa. Now that there isn't there isn't um, a, a non-native version, but I would go with. And I think this actually is pictured. The berries look different on the slightly different, but those berries are retained all winter. And birds do like them. They don't eat them as their first choice, but they're used if they're hungry. Uh, sweet spire would be would be good. Atia, there's a small cultivar called Henry's Garnet, and that probably would not. Um, it's probably one I, that I could recommend. Um, Clethra is the one that Mar Maritza was just talking about, right? And Alex Glabra. So so any of these shrubs could handle well, you know well draining soil but I, I don't I don't think they do poorly in the basin either as long as your soil is draining well. Itsy did you mention uh button bush? Yeah well button bush likes it wet. That's yeah. cool. um it is a beautiful native plant but it you know it really prefers to be wet a lot more often because you find it right uh you know growing on the banks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, low floodplain kind of areas. I, it might do okay, but I don't want I don't want to vouch for that because I, my experience is that it likes it wetter than that. Gets pretty big too. It does get big, yeah. Um, but you know, and I've I've seen an awful lot of rain gardens that started out nice looking, but you you do have to think about the mature size of these plants and and taking care of them just like you take care of any other plant, you know. And printing out the dead stuff, um, you know, making sure that you pick the right plant for the right place. I don't see any other questions. Do we have any other questions? Well, speaking of rain, it's raining. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a great presentation. I always learn lots of new stuff, Nancy. Thank you. I have a lot of spots. You know, we have a class coming up next Wednesday. Which what is it, Christine? And next Wednesday? I'm putting you on the oh, stage. Um is it hydroponics? Hydroponics is at the end of the month. Oh, okay. Uh, next week is just look that up. Audubon at home. Oh, next week is me with Audubon at home. <laughs> oh. Well, don't miss that. Don't. Oh. 
don't yes. miss that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end of the month, April 28th, we have hydroponics, uh, the number two. We gave the first hydroponics um, class a few months ago, and this will be a follow-up to that class. So Christina will be sending you an email with the link to the YouTube uh, recording of this class. And it, um, she will also be sending you a link for an evaluation. It is very, very helpful to us if you could just click that link and take that quick evaluation. That helps us to do, do a better job and to find out what your ideas are for future programs. So please take the time to do that when you receive that email. And Thank you. I will also be posting the May classes uh, sometime early next week. So we have a few other classes coming up in May. And um, hopefully we will have also have posted our Saturday in the Garden classes that are coming up. Great. Well, thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy this rainy day. Go out and take a look at how the rainwater is on your property. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks, Nancy. You're welcome. Thank you. If you're interested in lawn care, please contact our best lawns coordinator, Natalie Walker at nwalker at pwcgov.org. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. We can be reached at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.